Life of Emilius Paulus Translated by John Dryden Almost all agree that the Emilii were one of the ancient and patrician houses in Rome, and those authors who affirm that King Numor's pupil to Pythagoras tell us that the first who gave name to his posterity was Mamercus, the son of Pythagoras, who, for his grace and address in speaking, was called Emilius. Most of this race that have risen through their merit to reputation also enjoyed good fortune, and even the misfortune to Lucius Paulus at the Battle of Cannae gave testimony to his wisdom and valor. For not being able to persuade his colleague not to hazard the battle, he, though against his judgment, joined with him in the contest, but was no companion in his flight. On the contrary, when he that was so resolute to engage deserted him in the midst of danger, he kept the field and died fighting. This Aemilius had a daughter named Emilia, who was married to Scipio the Great, and a son to Paulus, who is the subject of my present history. In his early manhood, which fell at a time when Rome was flourishing with illustrious characters, he was distinguished for not attaching himself to the study as usual with the young men of mark of that age, nor treading the same paths to fame. For he did not practice oratory with a view to pleading causes, nor would he stoop to salute, embrace, and entertain the vulgar, which were the usual insinuating arts by which many grew popular. Not that he was incapable of either, but he chose to purchase a much more lasting glory by his valor, justice, and integrity, and in these virtues he soon outstripped all his equals. The first honorable office he aspired to was that of Idile, which he carried against twelve competitors of such merit that all of them in process of time were consuls. Being afterwards chosen into the number of priests called augurs, appointed amongst the Romans to observe and register divinations made by the flight of birds or prodigies in the air, he so carefully studied the ancient customs of his country, and so thoroughly understood the religion of his ancestors, that this office which was before only esteemed a title of honor and merely upon that account sought after, by this means rose to the rank of one of the highest arts, and gave a confirmation to the correctness of the definition which some philosophers have given of religion, and that it is the science of worshipping the gods. When he performed any part of his duty, he did it with great skill and utmost care, and making it, when he was engaged in it, his only business, not omitting any one ceremony, or adding the least circumstance, but always insisting with his companions of the same order, even on points that might seem inconsiderable, and urging upon them, that though they might think the deity was easily pacified, and ready to forgive faults of inadvertency, yet any such laxity was a very dangerous thing for a commonwealth to allow. And because no man ever began the disturbance of his country's peace by a notorious breach of its laws, and those who are careless in trifles give a precedent for remissness in important duties. Nor was he less severe in requiring and observing the ancient Roman discipline in military affairs, not endeavoring, when he had the command, to ingratiate himself with his soldiers by popular flattery, and though this custom prevailed at that time amongst many, who, by favor and gentleness to those that were under them in their first employment, sought to be promoted to a second. But, by instructing them in the laws of military discipline with the same care and exactness a priest would use in teaching ceremonies and dreadful mysteries, and by severity to such as transgressed and contemn those laws, he maintained his country in its former greatness, esteeming victory over enemies itself but as an accessory to the proper training and disciplining of the citizens. Whilst the Romans were engaged in war with Antiochus the Great, against whom their most experienced commanders were employed, and there arose another war in the west, and they were all up in arms in Spain. 
thither they sent Aemilius in the quality of praetor, not with six axes, which number other praetors were accustomed to have carried before them, but with twelve, so that in his praetorship he was honored with the dignity of a consul. He twice overcame the barbarians in battle, thirty thousand of whom were slain, successes chiefly to be ascribed to the wisdom and conduct of the commander, who by his great skill in choosing the advantage of the ground, and making the onset at the passage of a river, gave his soldiers an easy victory. Having made himself master of two hundred and fifty cities, whose inhabitants voluntarily yielded, and bound themselves by oath to fealty, he left the province in peace, and returned to Rome, not enriching himself a drachma by the war. And, indeed, in general, he was but remiss in making money, though he always lived freely and generously on what he had, which was so far from being excessive, that after his death there was barely enough left to answer his wife's dowry. His first wife was Papiria, the daughter of Maso, who had formerly been consul. With her he lived a considerable time in wedlock, and then divorced her, though she had made him the father of noble children, being mother of the renowned Scipio and Fabius Maximus. The reason of this separation has not come to our knowledge, but there seems to be a truth conveyed in the account of another Roman's being divorced from his wife, which may be applicable here. This person, being highly blamed by his friends, who demanded, Was she not chaste? Was she not fair? Was she not fruitful? Holding at his shoe, asked them, Whether it was not new, and well made. Yet, added he, None of you can tell me where it pinches me. Certain it is that great and open faults have often led to no separation, while mere petty repeated annoyances, arising from unpleasantness or incongruity of character, have been the occasion of such estrangement as to make it impossible for man and wife to live together with any content. I, Aemilius, having thus put away Papiria, married a second wife, by whom he had two sons, whom he brought up in his own house, transferring the two former into the greatest and most noble families of Rome. The elder was adopted into the house of Fabius Maximus, who was five times consul, the younger by the son of Scipio Africanus, his cousin German, and was by him named Scipio. Of the daughters of Aemilius, one was married to the son of Cato, the other to Aelius Tubero, a most worthy man, and the one who Roman who best succeeded in combining liberal habits with poverty for there were sixteen near relations, all of them of the family of the Aelia, possessed of but one farm, which sufficed them all, whilst one small house, or rather cottage, contained them, their numerous offspring, and their wives, amongst whom was the daughter of our Aemilius, who, although her father had been twice consul and had twice triumphed, was not ashamed of her husband's poverty, but proud of his virtue that kept him poor. Far otherwise it is with the brothers and relations of this age, who, unless we hold tracts of land, or at least walls and rivers, part their inheritances, and keep them at a distance, never seek from mutual quarrels. History suggests a variety of good counsel of this sort, and by the way, to those who desire to learn and improve. To proceed, Aemilius, being chosen consul, waged war with the Ligurians of the Orligurstines, a people near the Alps. They were a bold and warlike nation, and their neighborhood to the Romans had begun to give them skill in the arts of war. They occupied the furthest parts of Italy ending under the Alps, and those parts of the Alps themselves which are washed by the Tuscan Sea and face toward Africa, mingled there with Gauls and Iberians of the coast. And besides, at that time they turned their thoughts to the seas in sailing as far as the Pillars of Hercules in light vessels fitted for that purpose, 
robbed and destroyed all that trafficked in those parts. They, with an army of forty thousand, waited the coming of Aemilius, who brought with him not above eight thousand, so that the enemy was five to one when they engaged. Yet he vanquished and put them to flight, forcing them to retire into their walled towns, and in this condition offered them fair conditions of accommodation. It being the policy of the Romans not utterly to destroy the Ligurians, because they were a sort of guard and bulwark against the frequent attempts of the Gauls to overrun Italy. Trusting wholly, therefore, to Aemilius, they little delivered up their towns and shipping into his hands. He, at the utmost, raised only the fortifications and delivered their towns to them again, but took away all their shipping with him, leaving them no vessels bigger than those of three oars, and set at liberty great numbers of prisoners they had taken both by sea and land, strangers as well as Romans. These were the acts most worthy of remark in his first consulship. Afterwards he frequently intimated his desire of being a second-time consul, and was once candidate. But meeting with a repulse and being passed by, he gave up all thought of it, and devoted himself to his duties as usher, and to the education of his children, whom he not only brought up, as he himself had been, in the Roman and ancient discipline, but also with unusual zeal in that of Greece. To this purpose he not only procured masters to teach them grammar, logic, and rhetoric, but had for them also preceptors in modeling and drawing, managers of horses and dogs, and instructors in field sports, all from Greece. And, if he was not hindered by public affairs, he himself would be with them at their studies, and see them perform their exercises, being the most affectionate father in Rome. This was the time, in public matters, when the Romans were engaged in war with Perseus, king of the Macedonians, and great complaints were made of their commanders, who, either through their want of skill or courage, were conducting matters so shamefully that they did less hurt to the enemy than they received from him. They that, not long before, had forced Antiochus the Great to quit the rest of Asia, to retire beyond Mount Taurus, and confine himself to Syria, glad to buy his peace with fifteen thousand talents. And they that not long since had vanquished King Philip in Thessaly, and freed the Greeks from the Macedonian yoke. Nay, had overcome Hannibal himself, who far surpassed all kings in daring and power, thought it scorn that Perseus should think himself an enemy fit to match the Romans, and to be able to wage war with them so long on equal terms, with the remainder only of his father's routed forces. Not being aware that Philip, after his defeat, had greatly improved both the strength and discipline of the Macedonian army. To make which appear, I shall briefly recount the story from the beginning. Antigonus the most powerful amongst the captains and successors of Alexander, having obtained for himself and his posterity the title of king, had a son named Demetrius, father to Antigonus, called Gennatus. And he had a son, Demetrius, who, reigning some short time, died and left a young son called Philip. The chief man of Magadon, fearing great confusion might arise in his minority, called in Antigonus cousin German to the late king, and married him to the widow, the mother of Philip. At first they only styled him regent in general, but when they found by experience that he governed the kingdom with moderation and to general advantage, gave him the title of king. This was he that was surnamed Doson, as if he was a great promiser and a bad performer. To him succeeded Philip who in his youth gave great hopes of equaling the best of kings, and that he one day would restore Macedon to its former state and dignity, and prove himself the one man able to check the power of the Romans, now rising and extending over the whole world. But, being vanquished in a pitch battle by Titius Flaminius near Scatusa, his resolution failed, 
and he yielded himself and all that he had to the mercy of the Romans, while contented that he would escape with paying a small tribute. And yet afterwards, recollecting himself, he bore it with great impatience, and though he lived rather like a slave that was pleased with ease, the man of sense and courage, whilst he held his kingdom at the pleasure of his conquerors, which made him turn his whole mind to war, and prepare himself with as much cunning and privacy as possible. To this end, he left his cities on the high roads and sea coast ungarrisoned, and almost desolate, and that they might seem inconsiderable. In the meantime, collecting large forces up the country, and furnishing his inland posts, strongholds, and towns with arms, money, and men fit for service, he thus provided himself for war, and he had kept his preparations close. He had in his armory arms for thirty thousand men, in granaries, in places of strength, eight millions of bushels of corn, and as much ready money as would defray the charge of maintaining ten thousand mercenary soldiers for ten years in the defense of the country. But before he could put these things into motion, and carry his designs into effect, he died for griefs and anguish of mind, and being sensible he had put his innocent son Demetrius to death, upon the calumnies of one that was far more guilty. Perseus, his son that survived, inherited his hatred to the Romans as well as his kingdom, but was incompetent to carry out his designs, through want of courage and the viciousness of a character in which, among faults and diseases of various sorts, Covenus bore the chief place. And there is a statement also of his not being true-born, and that the wife of King Philip took him from his mother, Nathanion, a woman of Argos, that earned her living as a seamstress, as soon as he was born, and passed him upon her husband as her own. And this might be the chief cause of his contriving the death of Demetrius, as he might well fear that, so long as there was a lawful successor in the family, and there was no security that his spurious birth might not be revealed. Notwithstanding all this, and though his spirit was so mean in temper, so sordid, yet trusting to the strength of his resources, he engaged in a war with the Romans, and for a long time maintained it, repulsing and even vanquishing some generals of consular dignity, and some great armies and fleets. He wrote it Publius Licinius, who was the first that invaded Macedonia, in a cavalry battle, slew twenty-five hundred practiced soldiers, and took six hundred prisoners. And surprising their fleet as they rode at anchor before Orans, he took twenty ships of burden with all their lading, sunk the rest that were freighted with corn, and, besides this, made himself master of four galleys with five banks of oars. He fought a second battle with Hostilius, a consular officer, as he was making his way into the country at Elimai, and forced him to retreat. And when he afterwards by stealth designed an invasion through Thessaly, challenged him to fight, which the other feared to accept. Nay, more, to show his contempt to the Romans, and that he wanted employment. As a war, by the by, he made an expedition against the Dardanians, in which he slew ten thousand of those barbarian people, and brought a great spoil away. He privately, moreover, solicited the Gauls, also called Bastani, a warlike nation and famous for horsemen, dwelling near the Danube, and incited the Illyrians, by the means of Genthius their king, to join with him in the war. It was also reported that the barbarians, allured by promise of rewards, were to make an eruption into Italy, through the lower Gaul, by the shore of the Adriatic Sea. The Romans, being advertised of these things, thought it necessary no longer to choose their commanders by favor or solicitation, but of their own motion to select a general of wisdom and capacity for the management of great affairs. And such was Paulus Aemilius, advanced in years, and being nearly threescore, 
he had vigorous in his own person, and rich and valiant in sons and sons-in-law, and besides a great number of influential relations and friends, all of who joined in urging him to yield to the desires of the people who called him to the consulship. He at first manifested some shyness of the people, and withdrew himself from their importunity, professing reluctance to hold office. But, when they daily came to his doors, urging him to come forth to the place of election, and pressing him with noise and clamor, he acceded to their request. When he appeared amongst the candidates, it did not look as if it were to sue for the consulship, and but to bring victory and success, and that he came down into the campus. They all received him there with such hopes and such gladness, unanimously choosing him a second-time consul. Nor would they suffer the lots to be cast, as was usual, to determine which province should fall to his share, but immediately decreed him the command of the Macedonian War. It is told that when he had been proclaimed general against Perseus, and was honorably accompanied home by great numbers of people, he found his daughter Tertia, a very little girl, weeping, and taking her to him asked her why she was crying. She, catching him about the neck and kissing him, said, O oh, father, do you not know that Perseus is dead? Meaning a little dog of that name that was brought up in the house with her, to which I nearly replied, Good fortune, my daughter. I embrace the omen. This Cicero the Orator relates in his book on divination. It was the custom for such as were chosen consuls, from a stage designed for such purposes, to address the people, and return them thanks for their favor. Armelius, therefore, having gathered an assembly, spoke and said that he sued for the first consulship, because he himself stood in need of such honor, but for the second because they wanted a general, upon which account he thought there was no thanks due. If they judged they could manage a war by any other to more advantage, he would willingly yield up his charge. But if they confided in him, they were not to make themselves his colleagues in his office or raise reports, and criticize his actions, but, without talking, supply him with means and assistance necessary to the carrying on of the war. For if they proposed to command their own commander, they would render this expedition more ridiculous than the former. By this speech he inspired great reverence for him amongst the citizens, and great expectations of future success. All were well pleased that they had passed by such as thought to be preferred by flattery, and fixed upon a commander, endued with wisdom and courage to tell them the truth. So entirely did the people of Rome, that they might rule and become masters of the world, yield obedience and service to reason and superior virtue that Aemilius, setting forward to the war, by a prosperous voyage and successful journey, arrived with speed and safety at his camp, I attribute to good fortune. But, when I see how the war under his command was brought to a happy issue, partly by his own daring boldness, partly by his good counsel, partly by the ready administration of his friends, partly by his presence of mind and skill to embrace the most proper advice in the extremity of danger. I cannot ascribe any of his remarkable and famous actions, as I can those of other commanders, to his so much celebrated good fortune, unless you will say that the covetousness of Perseus was the good fortune of Aemilius. The truth is, Perseus's fear of spending his money was the destruction and utter ruin of all those splendid and great preparations with which the Macedonians were in high hopes to carry on the war with success. For there came at his request ten thousand horsemen of the Bastinae, and as many foot, who were to keep pace with them and supply their places in case of failure. All of them professed soldiers, men skilled neither in tilling of land nor in navigation of ships, nor able to get their living by grazing, but whose only business in single art and trade it was to fight and conquer all that resisted them. 
One of these came into the district of Mydica, and encamped and mixed with the king's soldiers, and being men of great stature, admirable at their exercises, great boasters, and loud in their threats against their enemies. And they gave new courage to the Macedonians, who were ready to think the Romans would not be able to confront them, but would be struck with terror at their looks and motions. And they were so strange, and so formidable to behold. When Perseus had thus encouraged his men, and elevated them with these great hopes, as soon as a thousand gold pieces were demanded for each captain, he was so amazed and beside himself at the vastness of the amount, and that out of mere stinginess he drew back and let himself lose their assistance, as if he had been some steward, not the enemy of the Romans, and would have to give an exact account of the expenses of the war to those with whom he waged it. Nay, when he had his foes as tutors, to instruct him what he had to do, who, besides their own preparations, had a hundred thousand men drawn together and in readiness for their service. Yet he that was to engage against so considerable a force, and in a war that was maintaining such numbers as this, nevertheless doled out his money, and put seals on his bags, and was as fearful of touching it as if it had belonged to someone else. And all this was done by one, not descended from Lydians or Phoenicians, but who could pretend to some share of the virtues of Alexander and Philip, whom he was allied to by birth, men who conquered the world by judging that empire was to be purchased by money, not money by empire. Certainly, it became a proverb that not Philip but his gold took the cities of Greece. And Alexander, when he undertook his expedition against the Indians, and found his Macedonians encumbered and appeared to march heavily with their Persian spoils, first set fire to his own carriages, and thence persuaded the rest to imitate his example, and that thus freed they might proceed to the war without hindrance. Whereas Perseus, abounding in wealth, would not preserve himself, his children, and his kingdom, at the expense of a small part of his treasure, but chose rather to be carried away with numbers of his subjects of the name of the wealthy captive, and show the Romans what great riches he had husbanded and preserved for them. For he not only played false with the Gauls, and sent them away, but also after alluring Genthius king of the Illyrians, and by the hopes of three hundred talents to assist him in the war, he caused the money to be counted out in the presence of his messengers, and to be sealed up. Upon which Genthius, thinking himself possessed of what he desired, committed a wicked and shameful act. He seized and imprisoned the ambassadors sent to him from the Romans. Whence Perseus, concluding that there was no need of money to make Genthius an enemy to the Romans, but that he had given a lasting earnest of his enmity, and by his flagrant injustice sufficiently involved himself in the war, and defrauded the unfortunate king of his three hundred talents, and without any concern beheld him, his wife, and children in a short time after, carried out of their kingdom, as from their nest, by Lucius and Nicius, who was sent against him with an army. Armilius, coming against such an adversary, made light indeed of him, but admired his preparation and power, for he had four thousand horse, and not much fewer than forty thousand four-armed foot of the phalanx. And planting himself along the seaside, at the foot of Mount Olympus, in ground with no access on any side, and on all sides fortified with fences and bulwarks of wood, remained in great security, thinking by delay and expense to worry out Aemilius. But he, in the meantime, busy in thought, weighed all counsels and all means of attack, and perceiving his soldiers, from their former want of discipline, to be impatient of delay, and ready on all occasions to teach their general his duty, rebuke them, and bade them not meddle with what was not their concern, but only take care that they and their arms were in readiness, and to use their swords like Romans, when their commander should think fit to employ them. Further, he 
he ordered that the sentinels by night should watch without javelins, and that thus they might be more careful and sure to resist sleep, having no arms to defend themselves against any attacks of the enemy.